Hello, I'm Dr. Daria Brzezinski, and you are watching What Wise Women Want on Charlottesville's Public Access, Comcast Channel 13. Every week, we bring you panels of women discussing all types of issues. Hopefully, this will help you make informed choices. Ladies, we are 52% of the population with 85% of the purchasing power. And we can use that power to make choice changes for ourselves, our families, our communities, our children, and our nation. So we hope each week you will join us in various topics that we're talking about. You can find out what those topics are on our website, www.whatwisewomenwant.com, and wise is spelled with a Z. This shows you what our weekly topics are, our past topics, and our future topics. If you'd like to ask us questions via our website, you are welcome to do so. Just fill out the form and send us your questions. This week, we are going to be talking about the history of education. Now, the reason we're doing this is because I've discovered that people have no concept of how we got to be where we are in education. Um, where do textbooks come from? The time spent units, the sections and the parts of the day, the subject matter, the subjects that we learn about. All of these things are part of the educational system. So we're going to go all the way back to the beginning and bring us all the way up to the present. Probably not in this program because there is so much to cover, but we'd like to start. And today, our panelists are three professors from the Curry School of Education at the University of Virginia. I'm going to go around the table and introduce our guests. To my right is Carol Ann Spreen, Associate Professor at the UVA Comparative Education Policy. To her right is Patrice Grimes, Associate Professor at UVA of Curriculum and Instruction. And to her right is Pamela Tucker, UVA Professor of Educational Leadership. Hello, ladies. Hello. Now, I, I'm not exactly sure where to begin, <laughs> so there's so much to begin with. So let's take a step all the way back. And I mean, each one of you has an expertise, comparative policy, curriculum design, um, leadership. So all of those play into our educational model. And I'd like, you know, when did education become a priority in the United States? And, you know, how far back does it go in terms of, and what was education about in those, in those past days? Would anybody like to start? Um, education, ironically, was not named in the Constitution. And although it's been a part of the fabric of our nation literally since revolutionary times, uh, it was not something that was designated. Uh, and Thomas Jefferson was someone who very much wanted that to be. But there was this premise that for 13 distinct colonies to become one nation, that people would need to be educated, that they would need to be taught how to be citizens. And so a major premise which started the common school movement in the 1770s was that public education was essential to a democracy and ideally that all children should be able to learn to be able to get that. But ironically, who you were and where you lived in the 13 colonies directly affected the kind of education that you received. Because at the same time that the founding fathers were talking about educating people, they were literally talking about educating white males Two-thirds of blacks, many of whom were enslaved, were in the South. There were no educational provisions for them. And women were not considered all, all in terms of how people should be educated. So those are just some of the key points initially in, in helping us understand the, the, the multiple, um, you might say, the, the parallel, I guess, curricula, the, the parallel elements in time that are going on, that there are different groups of people and different things are happening with them at different points in time. So, so we can say then that that the education goes as far back as when white people, so to speak, began. Boys, I have white, white boys. boys. Thank you for that <laughs> clarification. Um, from the time that white people, you know, descended on this land, we we had um, we thought about education. So, what was the point? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was, just, I was going to add to that. I, I was just going to say that the beginning of the education system was about preparing elites for the medical professions, for religious study, for running the government. And so it was about training white boys who were affluent landowners. Um, and 
I think thinking about education in a today and how we ended up today is the we don't have education as a constitutional right across the country. So this the importance of the 13 separate states with separate educational provisioning has carried through to contemporary times. And we're one of the very few countries in the world that doesn't have education as a constitutional right. And hopefully we can talk about that in a little bit. Wow, I thought, mm -hmm. I thought we had, you know, I thought originally it was a privilege and was legislated a right. But you're saying differently. It was legislated as an, a right, but at the state level. And it continues no. to be a state right. Uh, to this very day. So I was going to raise the issue that we don't even have an educational system in the United States. If we're talking about a system, it doesn't exist at that level. It exists in every individual state. Therefore, each individual state declares what the curriculum is going to be, what the assessment system is going to be, uh, who needs to attend school at what age, what are the requirements for attending school. All that kind of regulation is set at the, the state level. So we actually have 50 systems throughout the United States and then some of our territories as well. Local control has been something that's always been valued by communities. What has complicated that, though, in particular, has been, in recent history, um, federal government involvement, specifically with funding. And That's so, where I was going next. So um, to not jump too far ahead, because there are many things in between, but particularly when President Lyndon Johnson was in office, in order to, um, to support the war on poverty, and being a Southerner from Texas and understanding the way in which those local entities worked, that was the first time when federal dollars were tied to laws. And so there were incentives for local communities to, uh, to follow the law because they received money. And many of the programs that were instituted at that time we still have in existence today. Everything from Head Start to free and reduced lunch to money that's given for sports and athletics. Um, in the 1970s when there was school busing. And so that's the dilemma that people, um, and the challenges and the opportunities that people went through in the more recent past in terms of balancing the need for funding to enact their programs, but understanding that with that fun funding came obligations that they would need to meet from the federal government. Wow, states can be really schizophrenic. If I have to be, um, you know, if, the, if I have to comply with federal government regulations that are contradictory to state regulations or contradictory to my community who wants something different. Isn't and it's no wonder we have all this confusion. A absolutely. There are that there is that triple Hierarchy. layer um, of regulation and legislation that impacts individuals in schools who are merely there to implement policy. And it's a huge burden on school leaders yes. and school teachers because they're subject to, to local control, state control, and then federal control. What's interesting is the federal government uh, wields so much power, and yet their funding of education at the local level on the ground is around seven to eight percent typically. And then the state is tends to be 40 to 50 percent and the local community 40 to 50 percent, which raises lots of wow. issues around who's in control yeah, yeah, and yeah. who's calling the shots. And I think what's interesting and important to remember is historically states, the, the point that Patricia raised of states having a lot of say over schools and local control of schools being very important, that, that worked very well up until recently. I mean, the idea that you know, the expansion of secondary education became a very local matter, which is where you know, many more local communities got involved in decision making with education. But if we back up and, and talk about how the state is responsible for providing education for kids today who will have jobs in many different states, might compete on a global level, and are required to have skills for a, a different society in a different world than traditionally the boundaries and limits of state-controlled education are. I think to think differently about what the state should, is the state capable of preparing students with that notion of what we need for a modern society today. And, I, and that calls into real question about who controls the content of the curriculum, who controls things like certification of teachers, for example, yes. um, who controls how teachers are paid and how schools are funded. And 
you know, if you're competing on not just a national scale, but a global scale now, there's really different implications for how we're preparing students for much more social mobility and, and global mobility. Well, I was just thinking of uh, uh, the, the film, that, the documentary that came out several years ago uh, where um, John, not, not mm -hmm. Jonathan Kozel, uh, mm -hmm. Jeffrey Hayden's uh, Children in American Schools, where he went around and demonstrated all the schools falling apart. And my thought, that, the thought that just crossed my mind was, who pays for that? If it's local, state, and federal, and a school is falling apart, where do the fun, you know, how, how do they designate One that? One of the fundamental precepts of schooling is tied to real estate. And what do parents yes. think about when they're buying a house? Location, location, location. Right. And parents very often will look at the school district and then look for houses within that particular district. And so because the, the system on a, on a local level is established based on taxes, there's federal government monies, as Pam said, which are a, a part of that. But it basically comes down in many communities to property taxes. Yeah. And so if you're in a district or a community where the property taxes are higher, then the per pupil, per capita amount can be higher. And it's those distinctions that where you really begin to see the, the gaps between the haves and the have-nots in school districts, that some school districts locally are existing on federal money and subsidies, other school districts have that money and there's other money that is on top of that as well. And so um, there's a huge variation not only from state to state, but even with communities within states. And Virginia is a very good example of that. Well, I lived in Pennsylvania and in our community, we had the mean population was age 64. The teacher salary, the mean teacher salary was eighty-five thousand dollars, and they were, you know, this. There were very few students in the school because the population was elderly for the most part, and you know the roads were de depleted. All this, it was just askew. All the taxes and things were askew. But let's, we we really come, mm -hmm. in, in, you know, in many different directions mm -hmm. here. Let's go back to to beginning times when um, let's, you know, there were schools on small schools, for example, um, we call them one-room schoolhouses, um, where the teacher had to know a variety of, I'm guessing, mm -hmm. what were the standards in those schools in the 1600s or whenever it was, the 1700s? What, were, what kinds of things were in those uh, classrooms at that time? Now, we know there was a variety base, so they may have had 20 students if they had that many. Okay, one teacher, 20 students, and a variety of different ages. Uh, um, and different skills and things of that nature. What kinds of topics were those children learning way back then? What was the priority in those days? Well, to, to back up just a little bit, initially when with the, uh, the founding of America, um, young males, as Carol, Carol Ann said, were educated privately. Many of them had tutors. And then once they oh, were- Oh, so they weren't in schools. So initially people were not in schools. They ah. would have tutors and then in, when communities then began to form, the common school came together to give children who did not have the benefit of having the tutors and the private education an ability basically to be able to read and write. And there were also strong religious uh, values yes. and philosophies that were emphasized. And so it was the thought that in order for the nation to be strong, that there had to be this sense of morals and honor and integrity and so on. So there were readers that were basically designed not only to teach students to read and write, but many of it was based, many, many of them were based on the Bible, scriptures and things of that sort were used. Much of the learning was wrote. And it also did vary, as, it, as I said, where you lived. If you were in an urban area in the north, your schooling structure was different than if you were in the Midwest, which came at a later point in time, which was very different from Southern schools because of the nature of the um, agrarian society. And so there was even a variation at that time of what the common school looked like in those three different places. Yeah, because as we moved west, schools were transformed. Um, I think, isn't that when the, the one-room schoolhouse transformation began? Because people were moving out of the north and out of the south into the west. And so, you know, a different structure was set up across the nation. And schooling and education was a very big draw, particularly for, for new immigrants to, to the country. And so for them to be able to go west to know that they would have a community and a school would be an anchor to that. And that's also where the role of women came into play because women um, 